Hi, um, I'm Dina. I'm the lead data scientist at Cyberproof, um, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me for this uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, and here with me is Heather. Hi, yeah, thanks, Dina. I'm Heather Heather Dorr. I'm Chief Data Scientist for the UK and Head of Responsible AI for, for UST. Um, it's great to be here today to be talking such a, as, as Dina says, such a fascinating subject. So thank you very much for asking me along. Yeah, so the, the subject that we're going to be talking about today is actually, so the, the topic of the webinar would be navigating the new terrain impacts of Biden executive order on AI and cybersecurity. Uh, and in Cyberproof, I, I get to integrate Gen AI and also other data science and algorithmic solutions into the world of cybersecurity, managed detection and response. Um, and then before that, I also worked a lot in the domain of explainable AI. So I know at least for me, it was only natural to be immediately excited when I heard that we are now actually starting to have real governance and regulation in, an, in AI. Um, but I think maybe let's first take a step back and do some introduction. So what we will be talking about is the Biden's administration executive order, and it was issued on October 30th, 2023. So it's uh, like three or well, four already, I think almost four months ago. Um, and it talks about safe, secure, and trustworthy artificial intelligence. Um, but why is this exciting or why is it even interesting? Uh, I think to start with, at least at the point of time when it was actually issued, it really pioneered the law of making AI. It was the, the first regulation law-ish on, on safe AI. Um, so neither Heather or myself are like US citizens or lawyers, right, Heather? But uh, at least to my understanding, well, this is not an actual congressional legislation. It has the status of a law, uh, which is a really meaningful step. Uh, and it, it can be overturned, but I guess we'll not get into these technicalities right now. What important is that this is a really good example for a meaningful uh, government action that is more than just declaration. Uh, we had those declarations, we had summits, but this is an actual, this is an action. So it's much more powerful. Uh, and I think it's important also to note that meanwhile, for this like, past four months, we had another major things happening. We had the Bletchley Summit and Declaration, which happened around November 1st, 2nd, so right after. Um, and obviously this wasn't a law, but a lot of countries attended and signed. And, um, and more importantly, maybe we have the EU Parliament and Council negotiators are now reaching a provisional agreement on AI Act and also things happening in the UK. So things are moving forward. Um, yeah, so Heather, uh, if you had to give your two main takeaways from the executive order, uh, what would they be? Just a bit more in terms of the EU Act and the UK regulations, because they're now, the UK regulations, for example, are currently being mm -hmm. uh, enacted through Parliament. Um, so they're well on the way to becoming law as well. Um, and the executive order, um, yesterday, this, this is very timely, yesterday uh, Biden appointed Elizabeth Kelly, as director of mm -hmm. the um, newly formed uh, US AI safety executive. So what we're seeing now very progressively and fast yeah. is the progression of the implementation of the executive order in the US. And we're seeing um, law being developed and soon to be enacted in the UK. As, uh, as Dina, as, as you say, in terms of um, the uh, significant developments in the EU. So worldwide, we're seeing you know the executive order kick things off um, the EU were already very being very progressively developing law. Likewise, in the UK, Japan are also in the process of doing similar yeah. things. So, we're, as you say, Dina, worldwide, these things are happening. And so, I suppose my two key takeaways here is that, um, you know, so my job at UST, I we, you know, we well, 
so Dina's specialism in, is in cybersecurity for cyber proof in data science and general applications. Um, I work with large businesses to help them to develop and use AI. Um, and so one of what we we've, we've been doing this for a while anyway. Um, but one of my what I've been doing increasingly now is advising these large businesses on how to do how to generate and use AI. Um, in safe and fair and secure ways to ensure that they will meet the the legal and regulatory requirements as they come on as, as they come online. So that's my first takeaway. That sort of advisory requirement is is growing, and also yeah. the second takeaway is no business if they use AI is going to be able to avoid this. <laughs> so it's <laughs> something by all, all businesses and you know the, by exactly. the rest of us who use AI. Yeah, exactly. Because if if every business that is using AI will have to somehow change what they're doing or adapt, we're basically talking about all businesses because everyone is yeah. or will, if they're not currently, will be using more and more yeah. progressively AI. And, and some businesses, I mean, you know, in the UK, um, for example, the finance industry, the finance vertical and also the healthcare vertical are currently all re regulated for the AI they use and develop. So mm -hmm. for some sectors, this, this won't be anything new, but for others, it will. So yeah. there'll, there'll be, there'll be um, things that we can learn from the sectors that are already regulated in the AI space. Uh, and but, yeah, it, it, so it, that's, um, but those, the other verticals yeah. who aren't regulated at all now are, go are gonna have some work to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, th those are great points. And by the way, we we will mention the the UK and the UX a bit more after that. But I think in terms of like just takeaways from from the executive order itself, and and I guess it it will generalize to many other acts and regulations later on. So this one, as we said, pioneered, and we get to take a first look at what's gonna probably spread. Um, but for my side, uh, I might add that tra tracing the AI generated content and then also requiring companies to share their test results with the government are also very major things, in my opinion, um, because currently, at least like the tools that we have to to label or we often call it uh, watermark AI generated content, uh, they're really insufficient. I mean, they... They work okay-ish with maybe images and video, but then once we start looking at text, they are very, very poor. And I mean, as an example, you can look at the OpenAI text detector, right? That they discontinued somewhere back in July, I think, because they it basically couldn't work on their own generated text. So let alone if you're talking about open source models or other models. Uh, so these are still open issues to be addressed, but we already see a very specific declaration of meaning in the in the executive order that this is something that they're going to be looking very carefully at. Um, and then also, I think in regards uh, to sharing like the adversarial test results, this is also something really interesting, in my opinion, because in general, currently, there are almost no standards for red teaming of the AI products. Like each company kind of does their own thing. Uh, and may it, it will be very good to see some standards, like the general standards introduced and actually enforced. So this, this is also very interesting. Um, and uh, let me just add one thing because I, I remember seeing something like very dear and near to my heart, the cybersecurity, uh, there was this very specific passage in the fact sheet, and I'll quote it. Yeah. So establish an advanced cybersecurity program to develop AI tools to find and fix vulnerabilities in critical software, building on the Biden-Harris administration's ongoing AI cybersecurity challenge. Together, these efforts will harness AI's potentially game-changing cyber capabilities to make software and networks more secure. So for me, what stood out here is uh, we often talk about the cybersecurity aspects of AI, so how it can be and will be dangerous, but here they're actually taking the other side and they're emphasizing what AI can do for cybersecurity and they're 
uh, there is a very clear declaration of intent to do to establish this federal cybersecurity program that would harness AI for cybersecurity. So the, this is um, these are all very very interesting uh, like points and and things that the, um, the the regulations are talking about. Um, yeah, but I, I think maybe you can, Heather, you, you're living in the UK, so I know that this is very relevant to you. Can, can you maybe give us a bit more on the um, regulations in the EU and the UK and how do they actually compare to the executive order? Um, I think, you know, I, I was, there are some nuances and differences between between the, the acts and the, the laws. I mean, as you said, Dina, broadly, they're similar, very similar in principle, and you'd, you'd expect that, you know, you know, fundamentally, AI needs to be fair, fit for purpose and secure. And so there are standard ways of ensuring that happens. Um, you know, just review, taking a look through the, 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 the sort of executive summaries of, of, of the three um, groups, of the three acts, the three um, laws, the, the three sort of, regu well, you know, the regulations as they're going to come out. Um, the EU acts as a you know a strong emphasis on on the rights for transparency for foundation models, and also that fundamental rights um, a fundamental rights impact assessment um, will be mandatory for for high risk AI systems, um, and then you know there's explicit um, reference to um, prohibiting practices, so um, things like social credit scoring it is fundamentally prohibited mm. um and then using ai for things like emotional recognition recognition in the workplace or in education settings they're you know they they're prohibited too so they make some clear statements about what ai should and shouldn't be doing um if mm -hmm. you look to the uk act it's not quite so detailed or you know but so, to, to make it so it it, it doesn't quite make it explicit although you can read between the lines and, and assume that social credit scoring should, will be outlawed it's not made explicit so there, there's some you know it's there's some more there's quite a lot more detail in the, in the eu act for example compared to compared to the uk um and it's it, in terms of the progress of these things as well you know the the uk drafts ai bill which and its draft so it's, it's going through um parliament at the moment it's had its first reading last december and its second Will come at some point soon. I'm trying to find out when. It, it's not been it's not been published, so so it's it's going through Parliament at the moment. It will take some time. Mm -hmm. You know that states that there will be the establishment establishment of an AI authority that will that will sit across all the regulators in the UK and the regulators. Mm -hmm. So all the regulators, the different um, sector regulators, the finance regulator, the, the health regulator, the, the the retail regulator, for example, um, the the. UK, the AI authority will sit across and ensure that all these different regulators um, carry out their roles in terms of monitoring, um, you know, in, in terms of AI regulation. Um, but that's yet to be formed. Whereas just yesterday, as I say, Biden um, appointed one of his key advisors on AI strategy, actually Elizabeth Kelly, to be the first director of the newly formed um, US AI Strategy Institute, sorry, AI Safety Institute. So the US are still sort of progressing ahead at a faster pace. So it's just, and it is someone like me who's, I mean, when it was more than 10 years ago when I was um, working in health and we set up within the, the Central National Health Service, we set up monitoring processes for some of the um, machine learning models that we use to predict um, healthcare outcomes such as mortality and, and um readmission rates in hospitals um you know that was very very simple and small form of ai regulation and, and we're seeing now this these things happening at, at, at massive scale and so yeah. it's fascinating to watch and to be a, you know to, to see it happening and to understand the implications for for the people you know the yeah. people we work with our, our clients so yeah yeah no no i, I completely agree i i think just to say maybe add something to what you said while the us maybe is still kind of ahead we do need to remember that what they are doing is not an actual regulation so they didn't have to have all the process while yeah. in the EU and the UK the fact that hopefully at the end we will have a, a 
an act passing, I think it will be more significant. It will have like other implications. So we do need to give them credit for that, for yeah. doing the oh, no, full completely. process. Yeah. yeah. Um, but maybe I, I do want to go back to something that you mentioned because I found it very interesting. You said like the amount of details that you saw in the different acts so that the U Act is much more detailed. And I also saw that they also have the different risk level categories and they're really going into much detail. I, I just wonder, uh, what do you think? You think that having so many details is something that is necessary and important or does it actually need to be more broad and easy, easier generalizable? Um, I think I think the specifics need to be stated, otherwise people won't know what to do. And, and just putting it in simple terms, you know, if you're setting up an AI governance function within a business, you really want to be, it, it will be much easier to be, met for it, you know, for it to be made clear to you what you need to do to make sure your AI is safe and fit for purpose. And that there's an important role there for the government of, of of you know the the company you're operating in to do that because otherwise you will hinder innovation in the business because it will just stifle you know if 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 it's not clear what you what you need to do to mm -hmm. to show that your AI is safe fit for purpose you're you're probably either not going to develop it or you're going to develop it in very yeah. um you know very conservative terms in the sense of you're not going to you know because it's not clear how you need to rate how you need to show the regulator that it's safe for purpose you're going to make it it's going to be quite basic and simple <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that doesn't need to happen if it, if it's you don't get me wrong you know this the, you know more more advanced ai can still be governed and well governed but it needs to be clear how it will be governed so people know how to report to that to the regulations yeah. and, and the standards yeah that that's actually a, a great point because i I never thought about it this way, but the fact like more details, more like fine grained details do help people to understand better what needs to be done and then move forward. So I think it actually, yeah, it does help um, like the business and innovation not to freeze, but rather understand the exact path they need to take. Very so, much. Yeah. And, in, and in the terms of bad actors, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about a bit more about later. Yeah. But if there's clarity about what you shouldn't be doing, as well as what you should be doing, then mm -hmm. um, it makes it less, it makes it, you know, bad but things. Bad actors are going to exist and do things that they should, you know, that they shouldn't be doing anyway. But in the case of game in the system or whatever that, that does happen within, within any, um, yeah, gaming of the system will, will happen wherever, you know, whatever you can push. If the things, if it's made clear what you shouldn't be doing as well, then that, that makes the gaming of the system less possible. <laughs> and, I, you know, yeah. in, in healthcare settings, in, in um, uh, when back in when I was working in, in the National Health Service. Yeah. Yeah. I think, especially when we are talking about unintentional bad players, right? Yeah. Um, yeah exactly. Unintended yeah. consequences. You can avoid mm -hmm. those if it's like what you shouldn't be doing as well as what you should be doing, I think. And yeah. that's a challenge because this is an emerging space and it has and it will keep emerging for a long time um, mm -hmm. as new AI gets developed and enhanced and new methods are, are built and, you know, and used. So mm -hmm. if I'm honest, it's, it's, I don't envy the job of the people writing these, um, you know, this legislation. <laughs> So. Yeah, there's so much to consider in there. It's such a fine balance. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, now that we did some clearing of the details regarding the regulations, um, I think maybe we should discuss one of the most relevant questions to most AI professionals, but also businesses and so on. How does that actually affect us? let's start how does it affect us right now does it even affect us right now um or moving forward um a, yeah that, let, let me I, i'll let you answer first that's a really good, good question point and, and and i've been you know we've been talking to businesses increasingly about this because whilst for example if you're you know a large well i've been talking so just recently been talking to a large retail company in the uk and they're not regulated for ai right now but at the same time you know they want to follow best practices and they they want not only do they want to ensure that they don't have um you know a an in, well just 
I don't know, an event where one of their chatbots, for example, gets jailbroken, you know, and starts swearing, which is what happened in the chatbot recently in the UK for a large, a large company. So they don't want that kind of thing to happen. So they need to have the, they know they need to have the controls in place to do that. But at the same time, they, they also don't want their, the, the machine learning models, the AI they use to be biased by gender, by, by, you know, by, by ethnicity, by, by sexuality. And not only because they don't, you know, that's a, they, you know, these things can hit the news if, if um, AI, a company's AI, you know, turns out to be sexist or racist or, or something, they, they don't want that to happen, but they also have a set of ethics that, that they actually work to and they don't want to do that, you know, bottom line, they don't want to, they don't want that to happen. So the, there are drivers there now for, 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 bus, for any business and for, for, you know, for anyone who uses AI to, to ensure that their AI is, 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 you know, ethical and, and fair. Um, and so there's interest in business to do that now already. And then the awareness across business that the regulations are, are in the process of going through parliament and will, will at some point be law. It's going to take a while yet. And these things do, um, you know, they're, they're, they know they need to get the, the, there's a sort of awareness growing in business <laughs> and, you know, some people are aware they need to sort of, yeah. you know, sort stuff out now, but it, it's the sort of pennies dropping for, for for others. And that's, we're just, it's a sort of standard diffusion, diffusion thing, but people are becoming more aware of it and are taking steps, that, that, or seeking to learn what they need to do to be ahead of the regulations when they come in. So they're ready for them rather than, rather than having to be responsive that they, they've set up the processes. So w when you're talking about businesses that already do the steps, uh, those are probably the more aware businesses, but do yeah. you actually see clients that prior to that, they were completely unaware of it or, or didn't, I, I don't know if they didn't care or just didn't think about it, I don't think but, it's just, but now they're actually starting to. I don't think it's that they don't care, but, but, you know, but, you know, it's, it's but maybe it's just, just didn't think about the it. an awareness yeah. thing. And, yeah. and also it depends. I mean, you, you know, it's, it typically, you know, it'll come from the people that, you know, the executive in, in charge of risk management within an organisation will suddenly AI appears on the agenda, which, and it's like, well, how much yeah. risk is there then, guys? You know, I want to, want to understand that. And and so they start asking the questions of, of those innovating with AI in the business. And that gets, you know, and rapidly it's, well, we need to manage that risk then. And so those questions are being asked and then more, you know, exploration is going on to understand what 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 people what you need to do to to um to make sure your AI is you know fair and, and, and safe. Yeah and data data scientists are increasingly becoming aware of that as well. It's interesting conversations I've had, you know, the, the interesting thing is is data scientists are typically trained to build the best model possible, the best machine learning model po possible. And that by that I mean you know the most predictive, the most powerfully predictive. But if including gender or ethnicity in that model um, has an effect on the predictive power and actually you building bias into your model by including gender or, or ethnicity so actually you shouldn't include gender or an ethnicity in your model which means your model is going to be worse than it could be that's actually the right thing to do in terms of ai ethics but yeah. it's the wrong thing to do to build the most predictive model. So that's an interesting conversation with data scientists. You know, they're, they're trained education-wise to come up with the best model. Sometimes that's not the most appropriate model. Yeah, a, but I think it, it should definitely be like a business goal or, or I, don't know, I, I think it should be very clear in terms of business objective, what the company is trying to achieve. And then from there, it should, um, yeah, it should definitely go like uh, be understood across the yeah. company and for data scientists as well. So, much. and yeah. we're finding those those businesses who are aware are realizing they very much need to form an AI strategy quickly. Um, and yeah. that strategy includes the development of, of an AI governance function. So, you know, yes, yeah. so. It's fascinating yeah, it to work in. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I don't know. Uh, for me, at least, um, at, le at least for now, I'm not sure yet how the direct effect will be in terms of like the the actionable effect. Um, I don't know. At least looking at the executive order, um, a lot of the things there are just guidelines to be pl implemented in like X days time. Um, but I did look for some like more specific details regarding um, 
like the the actionable ones. So I, I think the one that I found was regarding foundation models and we, which will be bound by the order to report their test results. And they they actually set this threshold, like a hard threshold, and it was 10 to the 26 floating point operations. They, they actually set three thresholds, but this was one of them. Um, and I think this by itself needs translation, right? But roughly speaking, we can translate it using like a six and D formula when N we're talking about the number of parameters, like the size of the model and D we're talking about the data set size. So we're talking about pairs, right? Of, of data sets and models. And for example, we can be talking about a pair of 30 trillion tokens, let me see if I, yeah, 30 trillion tokens and 500 billion parameters. So I was just playing around with the numbers. And, and if we like just take for a reference, the largest open source model currently, I hope I'm up to pace, but this is a Falcon. I think it's 180 billion parameters. So, and it was trained on around 3 trillion tokens. So we are not there yet, even in terms of the largest open source model, but it could also be just a placeholder. They might change this number later on. I think they 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 felt they need to put a number or we could be reaching that number soon, like very fast. Yeah, very, because the, the whole, yeah, yeah the, everything is exploding. Everything is exponential. So we could be reaching this number. And, and obviously I don't know exactly the numbers for the propriety, propriety model, sorry, just for the open source models. But I, I think more interestingly, after reading all those numbers and understanding what we're talking about, I still felt there is a lot of lack of clarity in terms of actionable things, for example, with training versus fine tuning. So for me, OK, let's say I'm, I'm not going to be training this kind of model, but if I fine tune a, a, a model that might be reaching the threshold they're talking about, does it still apply to me? Do, do no, I need quite. to report something? And that is why I'm really pleased I'm not writing the regulations <laughs> because yeah. it's so very hard to define what, you know, what the, the those arbitrary, and that, they're not arbitrary now, but they'll be out of date very quickly because AI, you know, it's progressing Moving. so fast. So yeah, that's a, I thought maybe they put like such a big number because they're kind of like just they they know it's gonna reach there. So why yeah. why change the number all the well, time? Let's let's yeah, just do I mean, something. They'll they're likely to have to change it, aren't they? So yeah. So I mean, I, it would be great to move on to discuss your, you know, another of your um your areas of expertise and, and to to talk, discuss the impact of, of the um the regulations worldwide on on cybersecurity. Can you yeah. talk a bit about that, please, Dina? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so as I said, I'm a lead data scientist in Cyberproof, and in Cyberproof, we are monitoring the the evolving threat landscape and the potential impacts of Gen AI, um, but also other AI related threats. And I. I found it really interesting to start thinking about the potential outcomes of the regulations on both sides. So we have the arms race, we have the bad players, we have the good players, and obviously uh, this going to affect this going to have an effect, but it's interesting to think of how it's going to affect both sides. So on the one side we have the defenders and cyber of course being one of them and we are now equipped with this AI supercharged tools, which is amazing. Um, and we also have the guidelines, at least in the regulations on our side, because they are here to facilitate safety and privacy. Um, so I, I think maybe we can talk a little bit and, and dive deeper into a few of the points they made in the, in the order that I think will be very relevant for the defender side and is going to help the defender side. Um, and the ones that I pinpointed were fighting fraud. So there is a very clear statement of the order that you need um, a synthetic data detectability. Um, but even before you you can, because right now it's really hard, but if before you can or have that, uh, there is a requirement to authenticate the real content. And this is also very powerful. So actually now agencies and government offices 
will have to be able to prove that their content is not fake, that they like their content is real. So it can move the burden to them um, to prove the authenticity of their content. So this is obviously very, very important in terms of um, fake content, fake news, deep fakes, all of those. Um, I think the other point that the order made was uh, fighting the, the privacy. So privacy is something very dear and near to a lot of us, and we care about it a lot. Um, and we care a lot about the privacy of our clients. And they're, stay, they're promoting very clearly the uh, privacy uh, promoting techniques, sorry. Um, and so I think now we will see um, much higher interest and also development and usage of privacy en enhancing technologies. And I, I'm guessing a lot of them will rely on differential privacy, uh, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, but in general, I, I think this is something we'll see more and more of. And it, even just a month ago, there was actually a, a launch of AWS of their clean room for ML. Um, and basically what they launched was a platform that you can now share ML insights without sharing your data. So you can have two or more partners in there and you are only exposed to your own data, but you can get, so I think they started from a lookalike model, but they, are, uh, they want to expand it to more things, but right now we can get a lookalike segment of their data based on the seed data input from the other side, but none of them are exposed to the data of the others. So, and I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Yeah, and that's fascinating. So, yeah, the, yeah. The way in which the, these innovations in this space are going to happen. It's, I mean, I'm really that, yeah, it's um because I think that will facilitate a lot more safe innovation, as you say, um, in private and in, in maintain privacy that in, in ways we, we're keen to, you know, many of us are keen to do. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. It's it's the motivation behind the, just more of those technologies to to evolving and entering the um the the, the everyday space because yes. I, some of those things were already out there, right? Differential privacy, it's not something new, but the fact that we now put this as one of the top priorities that that actually motivates a lot of the companies to put out those solutions for everyone to use. Um, so yeah, so of course this this will increase our ability to protect the client's data, but still we can use AI and you can we use model. We can uh, learn more about the market, but in a safe and and in a privacy enhanced manner. Um, and I think the the other thing that I saw also was to, and we talked a little bit about it, develop program to fix vulnerabilities. So in, in critical software, obviously they're talking about federal and government software, but the, it starts there, it will expand, as we said, motivation is there. So they have a specific section that addresses the development and launching of special project that would focus on using LLMs. Um, I, I put out a quote somewhere. Yeah, to aid in the discovery of and remediation of vulnerabilities in critical United States government software systems and networks. Uh, so AI can automate the detection of new threats. It can respond more quickly than human analysts. Um, obviously, if we are relying on AI, we have to make sure that the systems themselves are secure, but this is supercharged. So this gives us so many abilities. Yeah, and that's fascinating isn't it? because it's like you know what I was saying about earlier that the 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 businesses, the large enterprises that I you know that I work in my area of UST, um, they like I say I said they've got an interest. They don't they not only you know they want to do the right thing and they want to be ethical, but they also don't want to be seen to be to have AI failures themselves. But exactly. in the security space, you've got obviously got bad actors who've got who've got no interest in that whatsoever that obviously that they're, they're, they're seeking to use ai to criminal ends to to you know to to bad ends that's why they're bad actors um and and that and use you know, obviously using ai to, to track that um is always going to be a challenge but as well as keeping up just just generally keeping up with it but how do you see 
I mean, that's what you do, isn't it, in cybersecurity? So, <laughs> how, where, do you, as, and that's the challenge because regulation could hinder that. You know, the, yeah. the things you really need in cybersecurity, um, <laughs> but you, it, and so give give favour to the bad actors. What what's your view on how that can be resolved? Can it be resolved? Yeah, that's that's such an interesting point, right? Isn't it? I, I think maybe it's not the most intuitive thing. We we think okay, regulations are here to protect, so great right, the they're just playing for, to the one side, to the good players side. Uh, but actually, I think it's much more elaborate and and more complicated situation than that, because I think we need to be very careful when it comes to regulation. Um, if you craft them well it can be a very powerful tool and it can ensure safety and, and security and everything that we want it to do. Uh, but they regulations can also slow down innovation, as you said. Uh, it can suddenly make the good players stop or freeze or think yeah. too much. Uh, and then it the we need to remember that the bad players don't really need to play by the rules, right? They they actually, they're not playing by the rules. That's why they're yes. the bad players. So they don't care about the regulation. Good players only care about it. So if you make it too strict, you're actually playing into the hands of the bad players. Um, so I, I think, for example, one of the things that stood out to me, again, was the hard threshold on the model size. Uh, and it's actually like a very specific threshold that if you are above it, if like the the flow, uh, the floating point operations is above it, you now need to do all those things. While if you're below it, you don't need to. And I think this can cause new models that will be developed to stay just below the threshold, just like just smaller than the threshold. Um, and while I don't necessarily think that having smaller models, not smaller than right now, but in general, having smaller models is a bad thing because I do think that we maybe want to increase the model abilities via um, like some algorithmic sophistication, not necessarily just make them bigger and bigger all the time. Yeah. I think it's something that needs to happen naturally and not because of the regulations. Um, and yeah, in general, in my opinion, very hard cut off policies are usually problematic and they can cause things like we have welfare cliffs, but they can cause things that are not necessarily um, what we intended to do to begin with. Um, so I think just to summarize, we need to be careful. Regulations can be great, but we need to be very careful how we design them yeah. and also how we enforce them uh, because we we don't want to be giving advantage to the bad players. Yeah, no, I, I do, I'd agree with that. And and like I say, with, with my lens of sort of more of the, the assuming that the the businesses we you are no, you know, like I said, business in general want wants to, to you know let's just, they want to do the right thing. That's less of an issue in this context. But at the same time, I, you know, I I know that for example in the financial sector the, the 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 way credit risk at the moment is estimated using machine learning is actually still quite basic because the regulator is quite limited in how they um you know well i don't know whether it's perception or whether it's the regulation sort of limits the the, the complexity of the machine learning models so they're actually quite basic and rudimentary particularly compared to to, to machine learning these days um yeah. and why i say that is is um regulation you know so regulation that's in that example has stifled innovation um and yeah. but it doesn't need to and like i say if it's clear about what you know it and it it comes down to how um advanced the explainability methods are and that's that's something that's currently limiting the way some you know models can be used in industry today in those regulated industries because they're not you know the the either the explainability methods don't exist or the regulator doesn't understand them. <laughs> yeah. So you know, so so in that sense, the, the regulators themselves need to 
be well um, trained and well experienced in, in order to be able to, you know, facilitate innovation using more advanced methods. Mm-hmm. Um, and because, you know, the end of the day, we've got very advanced AI these days. And I'm saying that because I'm quite old and I've been working in the industry for a long time. And it's obviously got very advanced in the, in the past five, 10 years. Um, but very, very advanced methods. And we've got businesses who want to use them. And it's, you know, it's going to be facilitating the innovation within the regulatory frameworks that's going to be the, 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 the you know, the key to success here. Um, I think it's possible to do it. Um, not all the time, you know, there'll be, there'll be some applications of AI that won't be possible in, in some, some, some industries because of the regulations. But I think, um, there's a broad sense, but then, you know, it's generative AI today, if we're going to put it in, um, an app, for example, that advises people what they, you know, how, how best they can spend their money that month. And we're talking about that with the client at the moment. We're going to have to make very sure that the 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 recommend you know you can spend your money on this, you can spend your money on that. I, I, fun as you know, someone developing that, I want to make sure I I don't encourage someone to overspend and get in debt, you know. And so that we can do that using um, guardrails and such like, but but we have to make sure they're very robust and 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 that you know that comes down to the way we build AI as much as the regulations, but the regulations need to facilitate that innovation. <laughs> it's yeah. a challenge but i think it, i do think it's possible yeah so uh, ev- given everything that was said do you think um, should we have the regulations do do you still agree with in general with having regulations do you think we have we need specific conditions in order to make the best out of them i, th- I think we need regulations um definitely um and I, as I say, I think I think I think with, with all these things, the devil will be in the detail. And um, so we need to we need to have clarity about what we can and cannot do with AI. In, in you know, and I'm talking about in business. So so in business, um, so so it, yeah, like I say, that the guidelines will be be clear um, for all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think clarity is and transparency and a very understandable path forward is is crucial. And in case it wasn't clear, I support regulations, right? I support having regulations. If anything, I think we are behind there because I think AI is already everywhere in every uh, tool in every area of our lives. So I, I think policies and governments need to catch up and uh, we, we definitely should have um, something keeping our uh, keeping us safe and secure and and keeping our privacy and and so on. Uh, but as I said, I, I think this needs to be very, very carefully crafted. and we don't want to have something too strict because this can stifle innovation, as you said. And we don't want to have it too lax because then, it can actually uh, lead to a lot of vulnerabilities and also people not understanding, taking advantage and all of the above. Um, but I think that the key would be to encourage standards that on the one hand, encourage development of, of like robust and ethical and secure AI technologies, but then also won't hinder the pace of innovation. Easier said than done, right? I completely agree with you. I do not envy regulators, uh, but this is something so crucial that it, it definitely needs to be done this way. Um, and I think maybe two more key things in in my opinion that need to happen in order for those regulations to, to be successful. Um, one is enforcement. I'm still have to say that I am it it's very unclear to me how exactly those policies will be enforced, especially because we have so many companies that are just they don't they don't even know what they have in their data. And they don't know exactly how much compute they're using. So this is like really, really hard thing to to understand and and enforce, but it has to be enforced because we don't want to have those regulations just out there without the actual enforcement of them. Um, And then 
one, like one last thing and I heard it being said in Bill Gates podcast I don't know if you listen to it but he has like a podcast and he interviews different people and he interviewed Sam Elfman just lately I think it was like two weeks ago uh, and he said that in his opinion we need uh, a global regulatory body so we need to do this multinationally we don't want to do it within it yeah. like we, we want to do it within each company but we also want to uh, do it together we have to do it together we have to work together we have to have unified policies we have to have unified enforcement um and the and yeah i think this is the way it's gonna work um yeah so thank you very you. much heather yeah, thank you uh, i i think we have like this discussion was fascinating and i really believe that this is really just the beginning like I'm, I'm really excited to see where it takes us the uh, I don't know like the, like everything the impact of their regulations when they're actually like the acts when they're going to pass but also just the future that we're building with AI in it yeah um, no, I completely agree it's a fascinating as I say it's a fascinating time to be working in this space and I've really appreciated this discussion Dina thank you yeah Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we have now time to take questions. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to send in any questions, please do now. Uh, my name is Dan Moriarty. I'll be your host with Tech Talk Summit. I want to thank USP for a great uh, webinar this afternoon. And if you do have any questions, please be sure to send them in. Because on the line, I am joined by Heather Daw, who you just heard from, Head of Data Science, Machine Learning, and AI at USP UK. Uh, Heather, can you hear me? I can, yes. Great to be here. Heather, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I do see that we had a couple of questions already come in. It seems like the audience really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I did as well. Um, so let's just dive right into these questions. This first one comes in from Divya, uh, who would like to know, what impact to information security do you see as being the most important outcome of AI regulation? Oh, goodness. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, it, as I think as we were saying in the in the webinar, Dean and I, it will make things clearer in terms of, so in terms of information security, what you can and can't what you can and can't do with it in terms of AI. Um, you know, GDPR has made that very clear in terms of data governance. Um AI governance will and, and associated regulations will have that layer of um security in terms of um making it clear what you can and can't do from a security perspective, as well as things like copyright and other things, of course. Absolutely. And another one here for you. This one's from Richard. Richard would like to know, how do you see regulation being applied to open source LLMs? That's another good question, too. And I think that's something that's being worked out, really. I mean, um, explainability of, of any LLM is a challenge. The technology, the explain, you know, ex explainability about the complexity in, in the model and showing um, showing aspects of bias or, or, or other kinds of unfairness, and, and you know, in ensuring that the model is is fair and, and fit for purpose. Um, with an LLM, that's complex simply because of the highly complex nature of its structure. I mean, you know, the most, in fact, most, you know, large language models we don't fully are, are quite opaque in the sense that we don't fully know how they work. We know they work very well, so. Um, I think that's going to be a challenge for any LLM, not only open source LLMs. Um, although arguably, because open source LLMs are open, <laughs> it should be easier with closed source um, LLMs. Um, but the technology is advancing to explain them. It's to be fair to say it's they're not fully there yet. But I think there's you know there's a huge amount of research going on at the moment, and USC are investing in some of that research. To, to to achieve a greater degree of explainability. So in terms of open source LLMs, I think. Um, I don't think there's much to differentiate between closed source, apart from the fact that by the nature of their open book, they should be easier to, to explain. Thank you for your thoughtful answer there, Heather. Um, another question that came in, and this one I think is dealing with something that was specifically discussed during the presentation. This one is from Raj, who would like to know, what is the level of specificity of the declaration of intent? Goodness, that's a really de that's quite a detailed question. I've been and <laughs> I'd have to go and read the declaration to to come back and say about the specificity there, um, reread it rather. I mean, it, it, you know, I've been focusing. You'll notice I'm from the UK. I've, I've 
I've, I've obviously been, been focusing, focusing on the US regulation and the EU uh, and the UK too. So in terms of specificity, I'd have to go and reread that. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, maybe the team can follow up with Raj um, after the event. Yeah, yeah, no, we'd question. be happy to follow up. And another question and I, for you. you know, there, there will be a question as well about the specificity in terms of what, what, what specifically you mean in terms of Absolutely. Specificity. Absolutely. Another question here for you, Heather. As a data scientist working in the cybersecurity domain, what do you see as the main potential outcomes of Gen AI regulation on defenders' work? Um, that's, and it's Dina, who's the, the two of us, who's the, who's the data scientist working in the cybersecurity domain. As I, as I said, on the, on, during the webinar, you know, my focus uh, in, in UST is is helping the, the, the businesses, are, are the enterprises we work with, to, to achieve um, to achieve business benefit with AI. So, so that's my disclaimer to start with. But in terms, of, so can you just repeat the question, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, working as a data scientist in the cybersecurity domain, what do you see as the main potential outcomes of Gen AI's regulation on defenders' work? Well, as I mean, Dina was eloquently putting it during the, the, the webinar, and, and you know, and, and I was, you know, really agreeing with. Um, it arguably it will probably make the defenders work harder because the defender will stick to the regulations, while, while the aggressor, that that the, you know, the, the, the bad agent, that will unlikely stick to the regulations. So, um, it's how we. Thing is, you know, I don't think either of us were arguing against regulations um, during the webinar. Although, you know, that there's arguments against that um, because of for this very reason in terms of security. So I think it will make the defenders work unless it's well considered. It's going to make the defenders work harder. Um, so you know, that's something that really is, I'm sure, being very well considered by all governments as they develop and enact the, the laws associated with the, these these new regulations. And Heather, what kind of steps should I take as an enterprise to understand the potential biases in my data and models, and uh, how should I approach it to start with? To start with, I mean, and this is thing, these are things we're, you know, I'm and, and in the UK and, and I know globally we're we're working with our clients now to help with and to guide them. Um, you know, AI governance functions within enterprises are forming at pace at the moment. The steps you can take to ensure your your data and your models are unbiased are use when, as you as you develop models machine learning models of any kind within your enterprise is to embed explainability within the production processes for your machine learning models so measure the levels of bias and, and fairness um, and in, well measure them but also you know make sure you uh, you know if I'm assuming you don't want your models to be biased. So, you know, you can ensure, <laughs> for example, you know, you can, ensure, you can ensure that using explainability methods. So, uh, you know, and as I was saying just a minute ago, it's easier to do that with some of the, more, the simpler models at the moment than it is with some of the more complex. But actually, you know, a lot of enterprises now, most, well, I would, you know, there's the simpler models such as HDBoost, logistic regression, and others are, are widely used. Um, by those people using machine learning within the enterprise and it's actually reasonably straightforward to explain those compared to large language models so you know to set those processes up now if you haven't got them set up already and to i mean you know we're working with, with our clients now to, to, to generate one click audit report uh, model audit reports when they run a you know when they put their machine learning model into into production or rebase the model or whatever so those those are steps you can do at a technological and practical level to, to to ensure you've got the steps in place to report to the regulator that your machine learning models are, you know, are fair and unbiased. That's a sort of technology perspective. And then there's the setting up of the AI governance functions that wrap around um, your, you know, your AI services. Give, give some thought to those and start, to, you know, start to plan them, set them up in, in at least nascent form, so you're ready to go when the regulations do, you know, do get enacted and, and you have to start to report to the regulator. And I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here, so we'll fit in two more questions, Heather, before we let you go. Considering the cybersecurity landscape, how can organizations effectively counter the asymmetric advantage that non-compliant actors like cyber criminals or nation states might gain? 
that's a really challenging question and I really don't have the full answer. I don't think Dina would either because that's one of the things we, we were discussing at length today. Um, I think, I th and I think that's the really the nub of the, you know, in, in terms of security at the moment in AI, that's one of the, the key problems. How do we balance the fact that um, defenders will likely stick to regulations and, and aggressive ones? Um, you know, that, that's, but that goes beyond, that, that goes at, to the heart of the, you know, the challenges there at the moment. We can inform that and, and, and help to, you know, enact it and help our clients to, to enact it to, you know, ensure they're secure and, and um, you know, and fair with their AI. But, but fundamentally, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a problem that's yet, I think, is yet to be fully solved. So one last question for you, Heather. Obviously, the AI, uh, the evolving landscape of AI-generated threats and the need for privacy-preserving techniques, um, what would some of the best practices be that you would recommend for fighting fraud and privacy breaches? And then are there any interesting technologies you might have encountered lately in this matter? Well, I mean, there's an increasing number of privacy technologies on the market. So to investigate those and to, you know, to work out the, the best ones you, with your business, that, that's the recommendation I make. There are numerous numerous privacy um, technologies on the market now and, and it depends on your you know your situation your need um, but I think this and, and the thing is to counter that there'll be different ways we use AI so you know for example when we start to get LLMs on our phones um, I'm certainly my phone whenever it gets an LLM on it my <laughs> the level of privacy on my phone uh, you know things our phones are quite private anyway if we choose them to be I'm, I'm just using this as an example um, you know, it's the way we choose the technology we use and how private that can be, I think. And, and that comes down, you know, it's things like um, if you, the, the ways in which you can deploy an LLM, for example, it can be completely private if you use it in a, in a wholly, in your, wholly within your environment. You can, be, if you, you know, if, if you deploy an LLM within, fully within your environment, then that's completely private. Whereas and of course, if you you know some of the the the, the, the close source and other LLMs out there that you can use, the, the the providers will assure you that they're private, and then they will be if you get those levels of assurance. But but it it depends on how you use the technologies as to how private and secure they'll be to a degree. And so it's mm. considering the way you use these models as well as um, you know investing in privacy privacy uh, services. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm well, Heather. Uh, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us for some q a it was a very great presentation the audience i can see a lot of good feedback here from them as well uh, so thank you again we look forward to having you join us for webinar in the future and uh, anything else that you'd like to share uh, before we let you go and no i mean th thank you very much for joining today everyone it's been i'm really glad you appreciated the session Dina and i certainly enjoyed our conversation and, and thank you for your questions as well it's been um, it's been a really interesting conversation thank you very much Thank you again, Heather, and thank you folks in the audience for joining us this afternoon. A recording of this session will come into your inbox within 24 hours of us wrapping here, so right around 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. That'll come from On24 with a link where you can hop back on here and review this session at your leisure. If you'd like to get in touch with Heather and the team at UFT directly, you can see some of their contact information in the speaker bio session, which I just highlighted as well, if you have a question that maybe popped up that you didn't have a chance to submit. And uh, we look forward to having you all join us again for another webinar in the near future. Uh, thank you again to Heather and the team at USC and Dina as well. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody. Until next time.